Hey, this is Mark, and in this segment we're continuing our um, analysis of residual energy and haunts. Um, we're going to speak particularly, though, of uh, objects, haunted objects. And uh, I had thought I had done with the series, but then I, I thought of the um, real popular notion of haunted objects. And I uh, thought it would be appropriate if we, we uh, um, expanded our series on that. You know, there's no doubt that some subjects like homes, uh, uh, some objects like homes are odd. You know, we purchase them and bad things start to happen. Too many to explain uh, as coincidence. Can objects retain negative energy, much like the environment in which there is an alleged residual haunt? The only difference, it would seem, is that the alleged residual energy is localized in the object itself instead of in the home all, all around. You know, perhaps you've heard of John Zaffis in his show The Haunted Collector. I've watched several episodes, and often he would refer to objects, absolutely, he seems to love that word, absolutely, would retain the negative energy of the people and events associated with them. You probably have heard of the Dibbit Box, Annabelle, uh, the mirror at uh, Myrtle's Plantation. Some of these are, are more famous items that are said to be haunted. Uh, this is a quote um, from, um, I believe it's Lisa Hicks. Yeah. What parapsychologists refer to as a haunting is like what you and I would think of as a recording. Residual energy is trapped in whatever object it is, and it replays itself. There is nothing intelligent about it. It just plays the same thing over and over again. Yes, yeah, that by Lisa Hicks. Does that sound familiar if you heard the earlier um, segments? If you know anything about residual energy and haunts, and that's the whole premise, is that um, when there's a trauma traumatic event, then that uh, allegedly transfers that, that energy to the, the surrounding uh, environment. So there's several things I want to say about the idea of haunted objects. Number one, there seems to be a general consensus by paranormal investigators that objects can be haunted either by ghosts or residual energy. But tonight, in this segment, I'm going to focus on residual energy as being retained in the object. See, you see, humans must, must, <laughs> when they die, go before the sovereign judge of heaven and earth immediately after death, so they cannot haunt an object or a house for that matter, but that's a topic for another day. But in my book, Seeing Ghosts Through God's Eyes, um, which teaches one how to teach, uh, how to think with the biblical worldview, uh, we talk about residual energy as well as the notion of ghosts. You may want to consider um, reading that. But the question is this, can a traumatic event associated with an object cause that object to retain the negative energy of that event. For example, if a sword was used to murder someone, could that sword retain the energy of that murder? Could this object become a, quote, like place memory, a recording tape of this event by storing its energy? The short answer is an emphatic no. <laughs> Everything I said in the previous segments regarding residual energy and haunts applies directly to this issue because the exact same phenomenon is said to happen. The transfer of energy it being clusterized in the environment and looping itself. Except in this case it's localized in a single object and not the entire surroundings or a home or an office. So if now, I mean, if there is a transfer of energy during this murder, and I'm not sure it's been shown that that has happens, but nevertheless, what kind of energy is it? Is it electrical energy? Is it thermal energy? Is it chemical energy? Nobody's ever been able to really explain that. But second, 
Whatever energy was emitted during that murderous event, when the blade struck its victim, this energy would immediately dissipate into the atmosphere. Imagine, excuse me for using the same analogy, but imagine putting a drop of food coloring in the ocean. Is it destroyed? No. But it might as well be because it is so watered down that it's virtually gone. By the way, I'm wearing these glasses because for some reason I can't see tonight. Um, it's so thoroughly watered down, it's virtually gone. And it certainly has lost any of its potential energy. Because there's thousands of miles of ocean for it to, you know, eventually um, dissipate into. The same, remember when we put the water in the, um, uh, excuse me, the food coloring in the glass of water? And how quickly it uh, reached equilibrium in the glass? Well, the same is with emitted energy from that event. It must dissipate immediately into the Earth's atmosphere, which is about 100 miles high, and it surrounds the entire Earth. You see, I have a space heater just a couple feet away from me uh, in, fr in front of my chair in which I'm sitting and writing earlier. And it will war warm up the small area that I'm sitting in, but it will not heat up the entire living room I'm in. Why not? Because the thermal energy dissipates. And when I unplug it, the, the heat that it did transfer dissipates. That's the whole premise and idea of this idea of the dissipation of energy. It's a simple notion of thermal or electrical or whatever energy um, dissipation. Um, See, so neither then will the you know you know the heat coming out of my space here won't make a beeline for some object in my room and store there and keep it hot indefinitely. You know, that notion is preposterous. An object like the sword I mentioned, or an antique, cannot retain energy any more than your room will stay warm once you turn the heat off. Same principle. Energy cannot remain clustered in an object any more than a drop of food coloring will stay clustered together if you drop it in the ocean or even in a glass of water. It's the notion is just simply preposterous. It's just contrary to an absolute law of science. And you know, um, as long as as long as ice melts and liquid warm, liquid warmer than it. Um, <laughs> then the second and third laws of thermodynamics are absolutely valid. Uh, one man recently tried to argue that uh, these laws had begun to have questions raised about it. But I've studied the literature, and in the real world, it is still absolute. My point is that an object cannot be haunted by residual energy because energy cannot remain stored in, in the object. To state otherwise is to contradict one of the most basic absolute laws of science, God's laws in nature. Remember, I'm not disputing that objects can be, quote, haunted. I'm just saying, as I did with residual haunting in general, it cannot be caused by natural forces. If you have not listened to my earlier tapes done on residual energy, please do listen to that because I don't want to repeat myself and I need to address other questions tonight. So, you know, one thing that we don't have time to discuss is how would you distinguish between an object that's haunted by a ghost and one that's haunted by residual energy? There are insuperable problems with that, just as there would be, as we pointed out, in a home. Thirdly, Okay, if it's not residual energy that's causing the object to be haunted, then what is it, Mark? Well, first of all, technically it's not haunted, nor is it possessed. You see, only conscious beings can be possessed. A doll cannot be possessed, like Annabelle. However, demons are very territorial. At least some of them are. And for various reasons, they do attach to objects just as they attach to homes and people. 
Some people and many animals are sensitive to the presence of the demonic, which are attached to an object, and they'll, they'll make that known uh, very clearly. And I mentioned Lisa Hicks earlier, and uh, let me quote from her again. She states, on his fact sheet, talking about uh, Zaphis, at the Museum of the Paranormal, John Zaphis agrees that such phenomena are all about energy. But he has a different theory about how energy got there. You know, she now quote, quotes from John Zaphis. With most of the items in the museum, they have been used in rituals, usually when spells are being cast, he writes. Although the items are not possessed, items can hold energy within or around them, and it's usually the result of the energy being sent to the object by an individual. End quote. Okay, Zaphis is half right. He got halfway there. See, what I thought was instructive about that quote from a man who has had much experience with objects uh, that have been cursed and demonized is that this expert in his uh, experience uh, with um, expert in the occult occult objects, he recognizes that there is a common theme or backstory to these objects. And this is important. There's a common theme or backstory to, to most of these objects. And that is ritualistic activity. Spell casting or curses being sent out by an individual to that object, which then attaches to the object. But where John goes wrong is it's not negative energy that's being attached to it. It's a very personal, pure, evil entity, a demon or demons. The truth is the curse or the ritual summons a demon who then is all too happy to attach to this object because this ritual has given it a legal right to attach to it and then to attack its owners. It's a demon, not negative energy, that is causing the, the um, phenomena and the symptoms associated with these objects. And by the way, when it comes to pure evil, we need to stop calling it negative energy. Um, that's just a misuse of language. And it um, downplays the seriousness of what the demons really are. You know, contrary to what the well-known psychic Sylvia Brown said, she said, quote, There's no such thing as a curse. That's just a goofy fortune teller's way of getting money. Uh, no, ma'am, Sylvia, you are dead wrong on that one. Um, curses are real. It's in the Bible, and it's happening a lot today. See, just as demons attach to dead idols that people worship, an example would be 1 Corinthians 10, in many places in the Bible, idols are, are dead, you know. There's only one living God. However, demons are attached to uh, idol worship or idols. So they can attach to objects that have been presented in an occultic, ritualistic fashion. An example, you know, might be the sword of a Freemason. You know, my dear friend Laura Maxwell told me today of a lovely piece of jewelry that had been given to her a while back, um, but she quickly got weird vibes off of it, and she later discovered that it was a Hindu object, so she immediately got rid of it, and the weird vibe stopped. This is instru instructive um, because it illustrates how common this problem is. This was jewelry, right? So much artwork or furniture or jewelry has been crafted by pagans with pagan intentions or occult symbolism. And as Zaphis reminds us, most of the infested cursed objects are due to some form of rituals in which spells are being cast. Or take the sword that we talked about earlier, uh, which I use as an illustration, the, the one used in a murder. You know, that may cause a demon to become attached to it because it took the life of God's image bearer. 
Thus, it would be an attack on God, on God himself. See, in one case, that uh, one of my cases, my client's husband had been in special forces and was dispatched to Iraq. And he was a sniper. And uh, he put on the, his gun barrel this tiny little troll about that size. Tro it was a troll doll. And when he came home, and by the way, it was used to kill a lot of people. I don't know how many, but a lot. He brought it home, and he was obsessed with it. He would put it here, and he would put it there, and then, of course, it started moving on its own. And in addition, he was also stationed in some of Saddam Hussein's many palaces, and he brought home a lot of the items in those palaces. One of them, by the way, I'm sure you're familiar with it, you know, the picture of the dogs, dogs sitting around a table playing cards. Well, it was that sort of mundane thing. But then there were other other more occult item looking items that uh, was taken out of Hussein's palace. But you can imagine how demonized that evil man's palace must have been and the objects. Uh, you know, the, the many people that he had murdered and tortured. So there's no doubt that, that these were part of the reason why this woman's home was being terrorized demonically. And parenthetically, I had pled with her to stop having sex with her boyfriend because it, she had said that he was having, um, he didn't have any problems and still, until she started to. And um, I said, you need to stop having sex. You're not married. And um, she didn't listen to me and he ended up getting possessed. Um like uh, her uh, her ex-husband had had become, and he ended up killing himself. The ex-husband did, not the boyfriend. So the source of an object's haunting is a demonic and not residual energy. So, number four, how how is an object obtained? Well, it seems that antique stores are especially vulnerable because you have old objects in an antique store. And you have no idea what kind of people previously owned it. Also, if, uh, if they had demonic activity in their home, it, it may have attached itself to some particular object in the home. So care must be taken when you're buying antiques or even used items or clothes. Now, I'm not, I'm not um, you know, you don't need to be paranoid because junking is supposed to be fun. It, I used to do it, and it is fun. But you just need to be familiar with occult symbols and be especially aware of items that might have some connections with fraternal organizations like Freemasonry. And by all means, if it feels weird, you know, get rid of it. Better safe than sorry, as my mom used to say, right? And especially if activity begins in your home after buying an object, then that's a clear indication um, that you need to do something about it, which brings us to our last subject, and that is, how do you get rid of it? Well, you get rid of it. Do not do EMF readings on it. And especially, please, do not do EVPs um, around it. That will only make it worse. And please also don't do like John Zaffis and now Zach Bagans and start your own haunted museum. Uh, I must confess, early on, when I was young and dumb, I used to collect the items I took from people's homes, but I learned that it was better just to throw it out, which is what I did. I tossed it out in the trash. All this stuff. You know, if it is a very expensive item, you may try expelling the demon through your authority in Christ or getting some help to do so. But if you're confident the object is cursed, then the best thing to do is to dump it in the trash or bury it. Pray the blood of Jesus to bind the demons and to forbid them from following you home. Um, this is really not my specialty, so if you have any further questions, you can contact me and we can discuss it. And if I need to, I can um, talk it over with someone else. But if you've been uh, exposed to a demon-attached object and you're not a Christian, and it's still affecting you, the first step is for you to become a Christian. 
and to bow before Him. To ask Christ to save you, you need to confess your sins, that you've fallen short of God's holy uh, laws. And I would ask that you pray with me um, this prayer. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that and thank you that the Lord Jesus died for our sins and that he lived and that he died and he rose again so that we might have eternal life. And I acknowledge that I need Jesus' forgiveness. I'm being attacked by a demonic force and I pray for your deliverance. Please, Lord Jesus, forgive me for all of my sins, past, present, and future. Thank you. And I ask that you might be the Lord of my life, that you might be the one who is the captain of my boat, that you might lead me, and I repent of my sins and ask that you um, might help me from now on to live my life for you, for you and not for my sake. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to contact me. Thank you.